This is about uh, analysis of well-being. During the first stages of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, using Understanding Society, and uh, my colleague uh, Jennifer Murphy and I were responsible for this, uh, this video. So the overall purpose of, of our study was to investigate the trajectory of well-being in the population over the course of the first wave of the pandemic. And we, wanted, we were also interested in sub-segments of that, whether change in well-being was distributed equally across the population. Um, so there are obvious things that might impact uh, from previous work um, and sort of theory. Um, medical conditions, social isolation, financial stress deprivation, these were all predictors for changes in well-being. And we're also, further than that, interested whether there were community level characteristics which might protect against decline. Um, so social capital of some form or other being the obvious uh, predictor. There's plenty of work done uh, prior to us publishing our own work, um, psychological effects of the pandemic, lockdown and contracting COVID, um, all are kind of relevant to thinking about what might actually uh, be causing changes in well-being. Uh, so there was uh, Dahiri et al's 21 paper, psychological impact observed across 18 different countries. So there's a, a, an effect that's pan-cultural. Um, and Google Trends indicated an increase in terms like loneliness, worry, sadness during the initial stages. Uh, that was a paper by Brodeur et al. So there was already a precursor in, in, in work that was published very quickly into the pandemic. Uh, it's, it's really just outlining that. So what do we do? We use the first four waves of the Understanding Society COVID-19 survey and used wave nine of the main Understanding Society as, as the baseline. So that was where people were before the pandemic hit. And then we're observing changes relative to that baseline. Our outcome variable was uh, the GHQ caseness score, a uh, very commonly used outcome variable for well-being. Uh, and then we are looking at the uh, impact um, of the onset of the pandemic uh, by comparing wave nine of the main survey with wave one of the COVID study. And then looking at the trajectory uh, of change in well-being over the first, up to the first relaxation of restrictions. Um, which was effectively in wave four. So we ran two different sets of uh, simple OLS regression models, uh, one for the initial response and a separate one for the decline. Uh, so we used uh, longitudinal weights inevitably uh, for these particular uh, models. So these are the explanatory variables we thought uh, on the basis of previous work and theoretical concerns uh, that might be relevant to predicting uh, whether an individual had a change in well-being. So deprivation, uh, and we have only got IMD decile um, by LSOA, so it's a bit coarse-grained and I'll talk about that later. Uh, and then community cohesion variable, which is co that's one of the survey questions. Um, so that's really look, looking at that social capital question. Uh, and then loneliness as a predictor. So we have loneliness before the, the start of the, the pandemic and, and how that itself changes uh, during the course of, of the pandemic. So loneliness, uh, obviously very tied in with ideas of well-being. And then the baseline well-being. And then uh, two particular variables, because obviously one of the impacts of the pandemic was the change in people's income statuses. Um, and because of uh, furlough and or even being being laid off. Um, so a financial crisis indicated by these food banks in the last four weeks uh, and an actual reduction in recorded income. Uh, covariates that were thought to be relevant were age, ethnic minority uh, and a, a dep deprivation uh, indicator and, and, and a uh, existing health conditions indicator. So the mean uh, GHQ caseness score uh, by sex is what we're showing on this diagram uh, and you can see here uh, 
probably reasonably predictable that there's this initial decline in well-being. So the case in score, high case in score equals poorer well-being. Um, and that is having a different effect on, on men and women. So women were more acutely affected by the uh, initial uh, the initial effects of the pandemic, um, and but the decline was also uh, stronger. Uh, the, sorry, the uh, recovery was also stronger as the pandemic progressed. And uh, there is, of course, a well-established difference in uh, overall uh, baseline level of well-being between between men and women. And obviously, this is self-report based, so we don't know whether this is to do with under-reporting by men or actual real differences in, between men, men and women in their in their well-being. However, uh, with the relative effects here are are obviously noticeable. So our first model here, predicting the decline in well-being. So this is the uh, basic uh, covariates. Um, and what we can see here is that the covariates are having not a great deal of effect. So you see these R squares at the bottom here, really tiny R squares, slightly more for the uh, female model than the male model. Um, but essentially, uh, there is no particular, nothing really going on here. So the covariates, actually are not having that much of an impact, uh, which is slightly surprising um, and noticeable that health conditions and um, IMD deciles are not significant at all. Um, now, once you add in <coughs> the baseline well-being, um, then there is a sudden increase uh, in, in the R square. It's a really quite noticeable change. So this is one of the big predictors of a decline in well-being. Um, however, uh, what's happening here is uh, is slightly surprising uh, because um, it's having a negative effect. Now, just to get this clear, that means that it's actually associated with a smaller decline in well-being um, than um, than uh, if you have a higher baseline score. So the, the effect on well-being is perhaps the opposite of what one might have predicted. Um, those who were already ha had poor well-being did not decline as much as those who were, uh, their well-being was, was good. Um, if you add in loneliness um, as, as, a, as a predictor, um, that uh, effectively is, uh, an, uh, adds in another a significant amount of uh, uh, to the R square. Um, so loneliness uh, and baseline well-being are heavy predictors of the decline. So here we are looking at something very specific going on in terms of possible mechanisms uh, because what we're actually after is a, a change in loneliness um, over the, the course of the, uh, of the pandemic. So during those ways and this probably is the mechanism which is causing this change in well-being. And that begins to make some sort of sense because if you if you have you're in a situation where you've got a lot of social capital um, and that is then challenged by the pandemic, the lockdown essentially separated out. It was a it was a leveler in that sense. Then your change in loneliness would, would be a natural consequence of that, uh, and that might then lead to a change in well-being. So we can see a possible causal mechanism here, although obviously this is regression data, uh, and we, we can't read too much into that. So this is the recovery, um, and again, the uh, covariates are not really making much. Uh, headway in terms of the R square value that we've got here, uh, and the predictiveness of the of of the recovery. But once we add in uh, the baseline well-being and the initial decline in well-being uh, as a predictor, then the R squares jump up again. So the recovery uh, it's a, feels a bit like a boomerang effect, uh, and. The, the, the well-being is declining and then the amount of the decline and the, the original baseline is then predicting the rate of recovery. Um, and that 
that is happening in a, a strong term. We reversed, because we're talking about recovery here, we've reversed the coefficients. So a positive value means a greater recovery. Um, and, and that again. And then we've added in a, a set of other um, covariates here um, to do with uh, somebody who's always lonely um, as, as, a, as a predictor of um, how well they'll recover and that is that's a good predictor and then this financial crisis caused by the pandemic uh, is also also a significant predictor and this uh, again increases the, the power of the model. So our conclusions. A declining well-being was first observed at the beginning of the first lockdown period at the beginning of March 2020. No great surprises there. Uh, but this was matched by a corresponding recovery between April and July as the restrictions were gradually lifted. There was no association between the decline and deprivation nor between deprivation and recovery. So this again was a slightly surprising result. Obviously the granularity of the deprivation indicator may have been an issue here. But the strongest predictor of decline in well-being was the baseline score with the counterintuitive finding that those with the pre-existing poorest well-being, the impact on the, of the pandemic restrictions on mental health was minimal. But those who pre felt previously well, the restrictions was greater. Um, and so for recovery in the baseline, the degree of decline, new economic hardship, and reporting of loneliness were all important factors. So just to say again, IMD was at LSOA level and that may not be fine grained enough. The findings do conflate several different factors. So the background effects of the pandemic, the effect of lockdown itself, and then personal effects of the pandemic. So individuals may have people who have died or have become severely ill, they either may themselves have become severely ill. And these will obviously have very particular effects on one's sense of well-being. Um, so there is a question about whether it's the background effects of the pandemic, the personal effects of the pandemic, or all the specific effects of lockdown. Uh, and and we, these are obviously conflated in the data. Um, and we, I mean, in a sense, one sense of that is it, this doesn't actually matter. It would be good if one was trying to get deeper into this to try and tease those out. But there is a kind of almost a collated effect of, of, the, of those things. Uh, the sample significant attrition between the main survey and the COVID survey. Uh, we have to be straightforward about that. Obviously, we've applied the weights that are available, but there are quite a lot of people who elected not to take part in the COVID survey who are in the main survey. Um, and obviously that may be um, uh, that, that may be a, a factor in, in predicting the, the change here. But people who suffer the biggest ch change in well-being may well have been the ones who have elected not to be in the survey. So there may be some biases in here um, that we have that we can't possibly pick up on um, that the weights won't help us with. Um, so that's something just to be, be careful about interpreting the, these findings. OK, and here's a reference to, to the, pa the published paper. Uh, and thank you very much for listening.